I guess I could turn it on and see if it works. I don't know. Yeah, it works. Huh? Yeah, that works. Yeah? Test, test. He's, he's back here. I got my pocket. He's <laughs> just crouched. He's behind the bass drum. I've <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Y'all make sure you get communion today. It's on the back tables. Go ahead and get communion now while you can. Yeah. <laughs> Jess is going to throw communion at you. She's getting crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Jesus, we just welcome you in this place, God. You are an awesome God, worthy to be praised, Lord Jesus. We just lift you up and give you everything this morning. God, we put our eyes on you, God, not on the things that are going on around us, but God, on you and on you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.
Just a few announcements besides getting your communion, because we're going to do communion in just a few minutes. That's why I'm saying get it, get it, get it. All right. So this, in a couple of Fridays, on August the 14th, Friday, August the 14th, we are going to be having, it's been about a year, a worship night. And it's going to be in here. So yes, yes, yes. So I forgot to ask the time. Six. Six. Stay tuned. Ryan was a little iffy on that. <laughs> I think he's saying six for sure. But we're going to have a good time. So if you want to come to that and just worship, we are so blessed. We live in a place where we can't, I should say country, but instead I'm going to say state, where we can worship. Um, I am part of several ministry groups on Facebook, and one of them's a, I think it's children's pastor's group I'm in. It might be the pastor's one. I'm not sure. But anyway, one of them said, Oh, we can only hum in church right now. Another one said, yes, we are humming. And they all were like, yes, we are all humming. And I thought, ah, oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> I don't want to hum. I want to sing. <laughs> but um, I'm glad they can hum because some people can't even do that. But we are so blessed that we can sing. We can dance. We have freedom. We can raise our hands. You can sit down. You can stand up. We can do whatever we want to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Never, ever take that for granted, folks. 
never take it for granted. Our friends in California are having to go out to the beach to worship, and they're doing it, like, I think this past week they had 5,000 out on Huntington Beach. 5,000 were out worshiping Jesus. And while they're out worshiping, because they're right there by the water, a whole bunch of them got saved, and then a whole bunch of them got baptized. And so even though there, it seems like government has tried to stop their worship, it has not been stopped. It's go, it, it, some of them are worshiping out by the San Francisco Bridge. You know the bridge, San Francisco? They're out there having worship services by several thousand. And um, they are declaring Jesus, they said, over California. Amen. And we're declaring it over Alabama, over the United States. May a revival hit us now. Hallelujah. All right. For, as for announcements, besides the worship night on August 14th, uh, we're having a men's ministry. It's beginning to start up. We started to get sign-up sheets ready for y'all, and then it hit us. We can't do We can't pass out sign-up sheets right now because we are just in a very... Let me just say it. It's going to make some of y'all cringe unprecedented times. <laughs> some of y'all said, we don't want to hear that word anymore. Well, it is, it is what it is. So unusual times that, that we're in right now. And so the sign-up sheets that we normally pass out are back there on the back tables. Um, and we have sanitizers. We have pens. So if you want to use any of that, go for it and sanitize after you use the pen. But sign up. Um, Jessica did the sign-up sheets, and she made Ryan as an example I said, oh, so instead of John Doe, and it showed how it, to fill it out, I said, you have Ryan Rowe. So, <laughs> so there's some examples, and it says what time would be good for you, what days would be good for you, so just, just fill all that out, guys. Please fill that out. It would be very encouraging to the guys starting the group if you would go fill it out to let them know that you were interested in doing this. And also, this coming Wednesday is a mask-making time. Now, in the lab, Bambi has a great mask uh, pattern that she used. She made me one. It's really good. And so they're going to be making masks or teaching you how to make a mask in the lab this Wednesday at 530. So even if you cannot sew, which would, if mom and I were going, we, we would be like, okay, what do we do? Because we have been in sewing classes and it just was not for us. It just you don't want to wear anything we've sewn, <laughs> maybe a pillow, we're <laughs> not sure. But one thing that we can do is, Bambi said, if you don't have sewing skills, like some of us, you can cut out the pattern. So we can do scissors. I mean, we, we got that down. So we can cut out the pattern and, um, and just come. It would be a lot of fun. And I'm sure she's even got jump ropes um, that y'all could make. What If you miss that. So Bambi can put you to work. If you just want to come and have fellowship, and there's plenty of space in the lab. Everybody spreads out, and they work, and it's really a good time. They've done it the last two Wednesdays. They're doing it again. All right, also Operation Christmas Child. We are still doing that. And there's, um, if you want to come and bring school supplies, pretty soon the school supplies in the next month are probably going majorly on sale. And buy, you know, notebooks, notebook paper, pencils. If you want any other ideas from her, she will tell you. Also, they always need the toothbrushes. They, they just need soap. They just need all those things. So if you have any questions, ask Bambi. She is back there today. Or if you want to talk to her while you're cutting out a mask on Wednesday, please do that. <laughs> all right. So everybody have their communion. If you do not have your communion, go get your communion now. We're going to do it different today. I like to throw you all off with our schedules there. All right, so Autumn, you were smooth. You got yours, and I didn't even know it. Okay. All right. Yes, we're doing it now. Get your communion out. I'm really throwing mom off. I said it twice, and she's like, now? <laughs> All right. Ooh, I'm hearing it. Y'all are opening it up. This is our communion right here. All right. Go ahead and get that lovely body of Christ open here. So nice and tasty here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me tell you, we have had several people in the church doing this on a daily basis. You can do this at your house. Not just do it once a month at church. You can do this at your house. A lot of people are fighting fear with this coronavirus. They're, they're fighting other ailments and whatnot. This week, I had, um, I've been doing some, labor 
over next door working on and painting, and I, my back got all messed up this week. It was bad. I could not hardly, I would kind of wince when I sat down, stood up. It was embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but I started, I was like, Lord, I am so frustrated. Dad prayed for me several times, and I would get better, and then the, the back pain would come back. And I started, and I had, I had kind of not been taking communion the last few weeks, gotten out of the habit. That's not a good habit to get out of. And I was like, you know what? I need to get back at this. So I started taking communion at the house again, and I am back free. I am free. I can't even talk. <laughs> back free. I'm back free. Um, <laughs> pain free in my back, and I have been healed. And so and it only was in two and three, two, two days I was healed. I was able to go work yesterday, and nothing bad happened to me. So hallelujah. So let's if you have any ailment, sickness, pain, anything, ask God while we're doing this. Ask Jesus to heal you. So here we go. Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. Here it is. This bread represents Jesus and his broken body. It represents our healing. Who needs the healing today, whether it's physical, emotional? We all need miracles in our lives. Our country needs a miracle. We all need a miracle right now. Please put your hand on your heart and let this prophetic word from Isaiah sink into your spirit. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Or by his stripes, we are healed. Say that to yourself. We are healed. We are healed. This is a prophetic depiction of all that Jesus would accomplish. You are healed. You are healed. I'm going to declare this over you. Your body, your soul, your spirit will be well in the name of Jesus. I declare that over everyone watching over Facebook as well. You will walk in well-being. He died for you. He died for you. He died for me. Jesus, come. Come here right now. Come, Father. Thank you for your broken body. Right here, there are people in this room. There are people hearing us over Facebook who need your healing presence, Father. Jesus, this world needs your healing presence. I declare healing into each and every person. The sound of my voice, by the power of Jesus. Go ahead and take the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you did on the cross. Matthew 26, 27, and 28 says, And he took the cup, gave thanks, for, gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. This cup represents the blood of of Jesus, our salvation. Jesus' blood changed everything for each of us. When that stone was rolled away, he rose in victory. We get to participate in that victory and live under the new covenant. You and I are able to go boldly before the throne of heaven because of all that he did for us and all that he sacrificed. By his blood, we have been saved. We are saved, set free, healed, delivered, his blood has set us free. And we take this moment when we, we use the phrase, we plead the blood of Jesus over. When we do that, we believe that he is protecting us. And so we plead the blood of Jesus over this room full of people. Name your family members that you've been concerned about. Give them to Jesus right now. Plead the blood of Jesus over them. Lord, I pray protection over every single person who hears this. We plead the blood of Jesus over everyone in our church body and their family members that do not get this coronavirus in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for everything, whatever it is that they are going through, Lord. We pray protection over them, no matter where they are and what they are doing. In the name of Jesus, we plead your blood over them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's take the cup and let's celebrate today all that he did for us. Go ahead and drink. All right. 
Hallelujah. Just know this week, the devil tries to mess with you. You say, "Uh uh-uh, I am I am protected by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do not mess with me, devil. Do not mess with my thoughts, my feelings, anything. Don't mess with my family. If you feel any, any fear coming on you, any sickness, whatever it is, get the communion out. We discussed this during online church. You don't have to have the grape juice. You don't have to have the perfect piece of bread. Just, just get something that represents his body and his blood and do communion. Pull out those verses from Matthew 26. All right. Y'all please stand. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity to be able to sing, worship, do communion, learn about you today. Refresh our souls. Father, I pray that winds of refreshing come over everyone right now. They're weary from what's going on in the world, Father, what's going on around them. Lord, I pray for winds of refreshing. Just talk to him right now. Tell him, Lord, I need your refreshing. I need refreshing so I can go out and be a light for you this week. We need your refreshing, Father, that no matter what is thrown at us this coming week, it will not shake us. Father, just refresh our spirits, everything in us, as we declare there is nothing better than you. I search the world. But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures the faith Are never enough And you came along And put me back together
I appreciate the word of God that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's give him a clap offering. Praise God that he is Lord of Lords and King of all kings. Praise God. Last week, 
pastor preached one of the great sermons on complaining. I thought it was just a great message. And a lot of other people felt the same way. And some people that heard it and online, they uh, commented about what a great message it was last week. And I surely do, surely appreciated it. And one of the things he did, he told some uh, examples of people complaining. Now, I've mentioned to you that uh, our daughter and son-in-law, they listen every Sunday morning. They live in Florida. But they listen to this service on Sunday morning, listening right now. And, uh, and so I told, I, I, we talked about the joke that he, uh, or the complaining example he gave last week about the woman that went to the beach and she said, I didn't like it. It had too much sand. Well, we laughed about that. And uh, so this morning I got a phone call from my son-in-law, Wendell, down in Florida. And he said, you know what we're doing? He said, we're going to the beach. We're going to check that beach out down here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Uh, I don't usually bring the Bible up. I just quote a scripture too that, that I've memorized. But uh, this morning, I was, uh, I was just spending some time with the Lord. And I said, Lord, is there anything you would like me for me to say when uh, I get up to uh, receive the offering for the morning? And immediately, the scripture, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, popped into my mind. Uh, this is one that I've memorized and many of you have also. But I wanted to bring my Bible today and just, and just look at that. Uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. You might follow along. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. And I've pursued that this morning a little bit further. Give and gifts will be yours. And then another translation said, give and others will give to you. And let's continue on. You give good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. I looked at another translation. It will be poured into your lap. And then let's continue. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Further, for the measure that you give will be the measure you get back. Or for the yardstick you use measuring, then you in turn shall be measured. Praise the Lord. We bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse, as the word of God says, and we lay up treasures in heaven, and the Bible talks about where there will be no one to steal it, no one to beat you out of it. It will not rust, decay, but it's going to be a gift for you. You shall reap as you sow. And I brought the tithe and offering in today, and I wanted to mention one more thing. Last Sunday, I mentioned that, the, that you, the people of the church, have just continued to, to give regularly and faithfully. And pastor has designated and sent money. And I mentioned last week to Good Samaritan, not Good Samaritan, but Samaritan Purse. Samaritan Purse. You know, they're the ones that went to New York and worked so hard to meet the needs of people. And so our church sent them $500. And then Dream Center in California, feeding multitudes of people, our church sent them $1,000. And then Food Bank of North Alabama, just going to add one more today, our church sent them $500. I just wanted you to know this and uh, and as we give today, we bring our tithe and our offerings, we come gladly and we give in the name of Jesus Christ. And I bring those that have been mailed in and put in right now.
you know you're in trouble when I bring spare batteries for my mic. You're in trouble. It means we're going long. No, not really. Not really. I have lithium batteries in here, and they've been going for three or four weeks, and I'm not sure when they're going to run out. So I may have to do a quick change out. I'll be quick, I promise. But last week we talked about, oh, I better dismiss children. Children, you're dismissed. Stay socially distant. Children's ministry is so fun. It's like herding cats. It really is. Have you ever herded, try to herd cats? If, you, if you've got a lot of children, you have. So you understand what I'm saying. Last week we talked about complaining. I want to reiterate one point because it kind of ties in with today's sermon. And that's this, that complaining is an expression of pride in our lives. It's an expression of pride. Basically, you're saying that I am entitled. I should not have to put up with this God. And we we complain. And sometimes we complain in prayer. Have you ever noticed that? A lot of times we disguise our complaining with prayer. Right? Oh, some of you are too holy. Some of you have done this. God, please help that jerk at work. We're not, we're not wanting God, to, we're not wanting them to get saved. We're wanting God to lay his hand of smiting on them, right? No, so you guys don't identify, identify with this at all. You've never prayed? You know, the Bible says we should pray for our enemies, but sometimes we pray for our enemies. God, mm, crush them because they were wrong, right? It's, it's kind of a form of complaining, Jonah did that. If you remember, we talked about Jonah maybe a month ago. Jonah complained in his prayer. God, I knew this was happening. I knew this would happen. I knew you would show mercy. I wanted you to smite him, but you, I knew you were going to do this. That's why I tried to avoid this whole situation. He was complaining. And sometimes we can, we can find ourselves looking at the news and, and looking... Portland, I heard a Christian recently, basically, they didn't say it this harshly, but basically they were praying, God, smite the rioters. That's not the way we're supposed to pray. You know, we we can look at all the situations that are going on in, in our world right now, and we can say, God, look at how holy I am. Please help those other people. And it's, it's a pride thing that we're, we're doing. There, there's a measure of pride there. And I've been praying during the season a lot. And, and every time I pray, I get one scripture. And, and you may be worn out on the scripture, but it's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If you've got your Bibles, go there. Some of you know it by heart. And some of you are, are, are going to say, well, you're taking that scripture out of context. And I'm going to, let's go into the context. I'm going to go in there in just a second. But I think one of the main issues during the season, in fact, let's read that scripture just for fun to start off with. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and will heal, heal their land. And it's interesting because you can see so many pastors preaching from this scripture because as they pray during the season, God is throwing that their way into their mind. And, and I, this week, I wanted to look a little deeper in that scripture. I want to look at it in context because I know some people say, well, you're taking it out of context. I want to explain that a little bit. But I think a lot of times we look at, we look at our world and you notice the scripture says, if my people... This doesn't say, if the rioters in Portland stop doing what they'll do, then I'll heal the land. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say if you elect a Democrat president, I'll heal the land. It doesn't say, my point, I hope you're getting this. My point is, it's not about what's going on. 
That has nothing to do with it. The scripture says, if my people, that's, I hope it's you. That's me. I'm one of his. God's not holding the people that don't know him responsible for what's going on. He holds us responsible. Whew. That's heavy. It is. If you remember the way, the way that God described the Ninevites to Jonah, you don't, do you remember how he described them? He said, we've got a people here that don't know their left hand from their right. He didn't put the blame on the Ninevites. The Ninevites were horrible people. You, you can go back and look in, in uh, sources outside the Bible to see some of the things they did. And they're so graphic that I can't even describe what they did in church. Really, really bad stuff. Okay? ISIS got their playbook from the Ninevites. But God didn't hold it on them. He said they don't know their left from their right. What, what was he saying? He was saying, they don't know me. And we've got a world around us that doesn't know Jesus. That's the problem. We're the solution. So I want to challenge you. What does your prayer life look like? You see, I think the problem is we become functional deists. And I want to talk about that for a second because I, I don't know. I made the term up, so you probably don't know what it means because I made it up. What's a deist? Anyone study deism? Who's the famous deist? I know that's the easier question, right? Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, two famous deists. I want to talk about Benjamin Franklin for a second. Deists believe that God set the world in motion and then he took his hands off. He no longer interferes with the affairs of man. That's what deists believe. Does that make sense to you? God set the laws of motion into effect. He created everything. Yea, God. They'll, they'll thank God for creating things. They'll pray for their food. They'll say thank you for the food. But they're not going to pray, Lord, please help our land. Because God no longer interferes with our land. Does that make sense? We as Christians have become functional deists. We believe, and what I mean by that is we believe that, yeah, God moves. But how does God move? Through prayer, right? Yes, right? Shake your head, yes. Wake up, church. He moves through prayer. And then when we look at the Pew Research poll on how long Christians pray per day, we see it somewhere between three and seven minutes. What? So we believe that God moves through prayer, yet we don't pray. We're a functional deist. We, we believe that, that God can, can do it, but he probably won't. I'll just pray. I'll just hope that we come up with a good drug. I'm just going to hope we come up with a great vaccine. Vaccines are the solution, Right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. And, and let me just say this. I'm praying to myself, okay? My prayer life is not what it once was. I can remember times in that youth room where I began praying and lost track of time. And I remember thinking, we've been probably been praying for an hour. Let's Let's leave. And going outside and seeing that it was dark and we've been praying for four hours. I don't know what happened. Somehow it just got stuck in like a time. In God's presence, there was no sense of time. My prayer life used to be like that. It's not, it's not there right now. Why? Busyness. Busyness. And I think about it. And I know prayer works. But I've been acting like a functional deist. I'm just going to work real hard for you, Jesus, and do all this work. And that scripture is powerful. And, and a lot of people will say, well, you're taking that out of context. Let me show you the context of that scripture. 
2 Chronicles 7, 14. In 2 Chronicles 6, Solomon dedicated the temple to God. And he said, God, please bring your presence into this temple. And he, and he prayed. He said, God, if, if the people, if they'll repent for all this horrible stuff they've done, heal our land. So basically, here we see an answer to Solomon's prayer. Well, that applies to Israel. It doesn't apply to me. Well, in um, Romans chapter 11, the Bible talks about how we were grafted in to the olive tree. Guess what the olive tree represents? Israel. So when God says, if my people, he's not just talking about Israel. He's talking about Christ followers. So the promises that were once spoken for Israel, you can be a Christian, you can believe, well, that was just historical, that was for them, that was it. But I believe, personally, that those promises are for me today. It's like being an adopted child, you know. We're grafted in. Guess what? Adopted children, they get the same inheritance as your biological children. Did you know that? Same inheritance. There's no difference in the law. Identical. I think there's some important biblical principles that apply. They apply to Israel. They applied yesterday. They applied today. They applied in 20 years, 30 years, 100 years, and they apply to us today, and they're found in that scripture. And, and just in case you think the Old Testament doesn't apply, let me show you something about humility. Because it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of God, New Testament. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted, New Testament. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. New Testament. Humility is an important thing. And I, I'm telling you, I think, and this is me, me personally, I'm, I'm preaching to me. I think sometimes we've gotten kind of proud Look at what we've accomplished. We live in, in the greatest country in the world. And we've gotten kind of proud. And I think it's time to humble ourselves and get down on our knees so we can see a change. If my people who are called by my name, I used to think, Called by my name meant God was calling us out. And, that, and it could mean that. But he's also saying, called by my name. In other words, have you ever, I don't know, have you ever been with someone who name dropped? Some of you have. But it's amazing how powerful name dropping can be. Sometimes it's entitlement. And sometimes it's kind of put off, puts me off. But, but sometimes... You get a speeding ticket. I can remember one time I was in Wynn, Arkansas, and, and I just bought my dad's Miata. I sold him my truck. I was living in California. In California, gosh, don't get me started, but California, they charge commercial registration for a pickup truck. They didn't tell me that when I bought the truck. So when it came time to renew my registration, I saw the bill and I was like, $500 to register a pickup truck in Alabama? This would cost me like 100 bucks. And they said, well, it's a commercial vehicle. I said, it's a small Toyota pickup truck, commercial vehicle in California. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to sell this commercial vehicle. Don't register it. And I sold it to my dad and got the Miata, which was cheap to register in California. But when I got to Wynn, Arkansas, the alternator went out on a Saturday. No. And let's see, when Arkansas population, what, 9,000 people? There's probably three auto repair places, only one of them open. I'm like, ah. Oh. And I loved my granny at the time, but I really didn't want to stay with her any longer. That sounds harsh, but 
um, she was to the point where she loved to cook, but she could no longer cook. And uh, here, I baked you some black cookies. Please eat them all because I'm diabetic and I can't have any of them. Thanks, Granny. Eat a pound of black cookies. And I was like, okay, I've had all the black cookies I can handle. I'm ready to get back home to work. And my car breaks down. So I thought, you know, my uncle, he's an optometrist in town, and everyone knows him. Maybe I'll have favor. So I pulled in this auto repair place. I called my uncle up. I said, look, the car just broke down. I need to be in California in three days. I've got to work in three days. I can't miss. I've got to make it there. I need this car to work. I think it's the alternator. Can you pull any strings? And this, this auto repair place had cars. I mean, they had cars. There was no place to park. They were busy. And I walked in. I said, my name is Jeremy Childers. Childers felt like child with the RS in the end. And they said, are you any kin to the Childers, uh, Dr. Childers? And I said, yes, that's my uncle. In fact, he'll be calling you in a minute. Next thing I know, my car was up on the lift. They had it fixed in like less than an hour, and I was on the road. You see, sometimes names have power. And I think what God's telling us there is he says, if my people who are called by my name, if, if my people who carry my name into the world, my name has power. If my people who carry my name, they will humble themselves and pray. It's okay. We can name drop. In the name of Jesus, I know him. There's power in his name. Drop that name. They will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. What does that mean? Seek my face. Let me tell you what that means. When I've been praying for COVID, praying against COVID, I'm not praying for COVID. I don't want COVID. <laughs> don't get me wrong there. But when I've been praying against COVID and praying for our country and all the crazy stuff that's going on, you know what I've been? I've been seeking God's hand. You hear me, church? I've been seeking his hand. God, give me this. Do this. I haven't been seeking his face. I went to asking God to do things for me, God. Please do this, do this, do this. I don't have time to spend with you right now. I'm real busy. You can see I've got to get the stream set up. I'm busy with all this technical stuff. I'm seeking your hand, God. Here, do this for me. Thank you, God. I know you'll, you're good. And I haven't been seeking his face. And we got to get to the point, church, where we seek his face. That means intimacy. But wait a minute, Pastor Jeremy. If you seek his face, doesn't, doesn't the Bible says, doesn't the Bible say if, if we see his face, we die? Exactly. That's it. We've got to get in his presence, seek his face until we die to ourselves. That's where the heart changes happen. And it changes the way we pray. We no longer look at the people in Portland like those, those people. We look at them like a people that doesn't know their left from the right. They need Jesus. When we seek his face, it changes the way we pray. Because we get his heart, and, and our prayers change. Well, what about this next part? It says, turn from their wicked ways. I haven't done anything wicked. Pride is wicked, church, and it's subtle. We don't see it. I, I think nine times out of ten, when I've had pride in my life, I haven't seen it at all. You know what? A lot of times people have pointed it out to me, and I was like, oh, Oh, and sometimes I'm like, nah, -uh. and then later 
when I have a prayer time, then I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. That's why we need each other. Do you know that? That's why we need each other. We need each other because we can't see the pride in our own lives. We can't. It's hard to see it. It's so subtle. Ooh, I hear music. That's pretty. <laughs> so see, a lot of times I've looked at this scripture and I said, seek my face and turn from the wicked way. Oh, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm, I don't have wicked ways. I'm holy. Yeah. You ever get angry when you're driving? I think that's God's way of showing me that I haven't arrived yet. <laughs> I have a, a little button. I, I, cha- I took out the cigarette lighter in my car, that little switch, and I put in a button that says fire missiles. <laughs> and, and when cars cut me off, I go, Ugh! it makes me feel good. <laughs> I do sound effects and all. Before that, I used to say words that shouldn't be spoken. So it's kind of a, it's a step in the right direction. That's all I'm saying. But it lets me know I haven't arrived yet. I have anger issues sometimes. I get angry. And a lot of times it's because I haven't got God's heart. I've been seeking his hand, but I haven't, I haven't seeked his face. I haven't seeked his face. Well, I don't have time to pray for a long time. Here's the thing. If you get in the habit of seeking his face, you'll be amazed. As you do it on a regular basis, you'll be amazed at how fast God's presence shows up. He'll show up quickly. He knows your schedule. Did you know that God stands outside of time and space? He can multiply time. What do I mean by that? Uh, I use an example. One day this week, at nighttime, I decided to stay up really late and pray. And I have to, I don't know about you, some people need like six hours sleep, some people four, some people more. I absolutely need eight hours of sleep. If I get seven solid hours, I'm good. But I have to, I'm going to be in bed for eight hours. I have to. Because my vestibular system is compromised. And if I don't get my eight hours, I get wobbly. And I have to concentrate on walking. And I'm walking out of frame. Sorry, streaming people. (laughs) People are getting on to me because I walk too much. I'm trying to stay attached to this podium. Thinking about tying my shoestrings. And then, yeah, bro, that's exactly what will happen. I'll fall down. But it'll be entertaining. It may go viral. Wouldn't that be cool? Lost my whole train of thought. Sometimes I need the eight hours of sleep. So one day I wanted to put God to the test. I said, God, I know that you stand outside of time. Time means nothing to you. I need you to multiply my sleep tonight. I'm not going to get my eight hours, and I need to function tomorrow. I have to be up early. I slept like a rock. Woke up after five hours feeling like I'd slept for ten. What happened? God said, I seeked his face. He said, okay, I'm going to give you the time back that you needed. And so many people say, well, I don't have time to do X, Y, Z, right? That's the number one excuse we all use. I don't have time. Hey, can you do lunch? I don't have time. Let's pray. I don't have time. Let's go work out. I don't have time, right? God multiplies time. If you'll seek his face, he'll give time back to you. That's why you see people that, that really follow God that got up 4 o'clock in the morning and did a full day and then did it all over the next day again, over and over and over and over again. Because God was multiplying. 
their sleep while they were sleeping. I'll tell you something really cool. God has shown up in dreams. His presence has been so thick in dreams that I woke up almost, almost feeling like I had been drunk in the spirit. Because while I was dreaming, God's presence came on me. That's awesome music. Someone really needs to get a hold of you. You may want to go out and take that call because, I mean, telemarketers are not that persistent. Just saying. I'm going to close out. I know I've got, I've got 15 minutes left. Wow. You guys are going to get out of here early, but I'm going to close with a long story. Can you come and play? This story could go on forever because I'm making it up as I go along. <laughs> some of you are getting nervous. I see people back there, uh-oh. I saw some eyes get real big. I am making the story up. This is, this is not a true story. Sometimes when I do this, I've done this in the past, where I've used uh, what I would call, I'm, I'm attempting to do a modern parable kind of. Sometimes in the past, I, I can remember one that I did um, years ago, and I stopped the, the whole story, and I had people come up for weeks afterwards saying, what happened to those two people? It was a fake story. <laughs> It's fake news, okay? This is not a real story. I made this up, okay? So don't ask me how the dog's doing at the end of the story or anything like that, okay? <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a boy. His name was Johnny Jr. Johnny Jr. And the thing that he wanted more than anything else in the world, he wanted a dog. He asked his parents over and over and over again. He was, he was 13. He said, Mom and Dad, please, can I have a dog? Please, can I have a dog? He was persistent. But he was a strong-willed, kind of independent child, only born. He wasn't real responsible. And his mother had allergies to dogs. His mother had an allergy but he was persistent. Johnny Jr. kept asking, please, please, Dad, can I have a dog? And finally, the dad relented and said this, look, maybe. And Johnny Jr. was so excited. Maybe, what do I have to do, Dad? What do I have to do? He said, if you can show that you're responsible, because you're going to have to take care of this dog. Your mom, she's got allergies. You're going to have to take care of this dog, and it's going to have to be an outside dog, so you're going to have to save up the money, and you're going to have to build the doghouse. Johnny Jr. He said, great. He goes, I'll clean my room every day. I'll make sure it stays clean. I'm going to be responsible. He put up a chart on the wall. His dad gave him some stars, and every day he would make his bed up in the morning to show he was responsible. And he put a star on his little thing. He did it every day. His dad said, you got to do this for two months. And then you got to save your money because you're going to have to buy and build a doghouse. They're not, they're not cheap. He said, I'm going to do it, Dad. I can do it. He saved. He saved all his money about three days before his two months was up. Johnny, Johnny had 80 bucks and he took it to his dad. He said, look, I found a doghouse kit on Amazon Prime. Here's the money for it. Buy it for me and I'll have it put together when my two months is up. So the dad ordered it. The kit came in. And, and the cool thing is Johnny had been given a tool set by his dad for Christmas. It was filled with his grandfather's old tools and it was a craftsman tool kit. It was a pretty nice box. But you know what, Johnny, he didn't see the value in that tool kit. He didn't see the value. He didn't want any old tool, he wanted a new video game. So he traded it to his buddy Frank. He traded the toolbox with all of his grandfather's tools he traded it to his friend for Call of Duty, video game. He traded it. 
And the kid came in, and the directions were in Chinglish. Now, some of you don't know what Chinglish is, and I don't mean any disrespect, but when you take any language and you try to translate it into English using software, you get some problems. In fact, throw those up on the screen if you would. Unrecycle. So anyone that tells you they get on to you for not recycling your can, say, well, in China, they have unrecycle stations. It's true. Go to the next one. Okay. This is kind of inappropriate, but they figured out a way to stop shoplifting in China. They really did, and, and it was genius. But if you're handicapped and you go to China, look for the deformed man toilet. Okay, that's where you need to go. Anyway, go to the next one. Yeah. Do not disturb the grass becomes. Do not disturb teeny grass is dreaming. So can you imagine trying to figure out a manual written? Go to the next one. I think there's one more. Yeah, uh, we talk about our problems in this country. They've got some serious problems in China. That's, what, uh, that's all I'm saying. Go, next one. Is there another one? Okay, can we get a side of fries with that? Is there, are there any more? Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, this, this means be careful not to bang your head, but it says carefully bang head. So can you imagine, okay, that's enough. You can, you can stop them. Can you imagine trying to read a manual written in Chinglish? So this little 13-year-old, he's reading the manual, and he realizes, I need the tools. And it's getting late, and tomorrow's the day he's supposed to get his dog. And he's got this kit, and it's laying in the foreign pieces, and he's in tears. He doesn't want to admit to his dad, Dad, I traded my tools. They're gone. I can't do this. I can't do it. There's nothing. I've been working at it four hours. I don't get it. I don't understand the directions. I don't have the tools. And finally, Johnny Jr. decides he's going to swallow his pride. He's going to come clean to his dad. And he knocks on his dad's office door at home. And he says, Dad, can I talk to you? And the dad says, sure. You're always welcome. He says, I don't know how to say this, but I traded the tools you gave me for Christmas because I didn't want them. And now I can't put the doghouse together. And Johnny's dad just smiled. And out from behind the desk came the toolbox. He said, Frank's, Frank's dad called me when he realized you traded $300 worth of tools for a $30 game. He says, I bought the game. I paid, paid them for the game, and I got your tools back. Johnny said, can, can you help me do it? And he says, I've just been waiting for you to ask. I've just been waiting for you to ask. You see, God is waiting for us to ask. We've traded the biggest tool he's given us, prayer. We've traded it for other things. We've traded it in busyness. God, I don't have time to pray because I'm busy doing this. We've traded it. But it's still there with the Father. Seek his face. He still has it. He wants to help you do it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you implying that God doesn't hear? Doesn't God hear all our prayers? Well, it says... It says this. Let me see if I can find it. Right here. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. What does that mean? Let me, let me change it to a different version. If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Passion Translation says this. Yet if I had closed my eyes to my sin, the Lord God would have closed his ears to my prayer. You see, part of humbling ourselves 
is coming to the place of repentance. You can't have active sin in your life and be living like the devil and say, okay, God, I'm desperate. Uh, I need your hand right here. Do this for me. Because the scripture says we've got to humble ourselves first. We humble ourselves first. Would you stand with me? James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. And I love what the Amplified Bible says. It says this. It says, The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, believer, can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. If someone were, were to look at your life, would they see that prayer is powerful in your life. If they can't see it, maybe you've been a functional deist. Or maybe you haven't got the concept of persistent prayer. Do you remember Elijah? Elijah is a pretty big deal, right? Elijah, how many times did he pray for rain up on the mountain? He's Elijah, right? He only had to pray one time and whoosh. No. He sent the messenger to the sea how many times? Seven. Seven times. And then the cloud, how big was it? The size of your hand. I don't know about you, but that doesn't say rainstorm to me. But Elijah was persistent in his prayer seven times. Over and over and over and over again. And then when he saw the glimmer of hope, he said, thank you, Jesus, my prayers answered. Thank you, God, my prayers answered, and he started running. When the cloud was decided, why? Because he had faith. And if we'll learn to pray like that, pray like that, be persistent. God, please help COVID go away. Amen. No, persistent. Seek his face. Get in his presence. And then see how he transforms your heart. He'll show you even how to pray. Do you know that? The Holy Spirit knows what needs to be said. Do you have pride in your life? Settle pride? Bow your heads with him. Let's pray. Father, if we're functional deists, Lord, if we've been living like deists, when we claim to know that you are a God that moves on our behalf, convict us now, Lord. If we've been praying the average of three minutes a day, Lord, convict us now, Lord. Bring us to the place where we seek your face, Lord, where we get lost in your presence where the hours go by. In that place of transformation, Lord, let us get lost in your presence, Lord. Where our faith is, where our faith grows up, where it's strengthened, where we can see a cloud the size of our hand and know that you're bringing the rain. Bring us to that place, Lord, Show us the pride. Examine our hearts, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you awaken the church in America, Lord. That you wake us up, Lord. That we rise and we worship. We become a people of worship. Where your presence drips off us everywhere we go where the world sees hope in us and the entire outlook of our nation changes. Father, we pray against the political spirit that controls our country, Lord. We break it in the name of Jesus. We pray that your presence will come in our land, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us be your agents. Let us be your people. 
who carry your name into the land. Praise you, Father. Okay, I've got one minute left. Can you just take a second and make an altar where you are and just pray on your own? And humble yourself. If you can kneel down, maybe your knees can't handle that. If your knees can't handle that, sit down. Just change your prayer position. And, and, and close yourself out in prayer. And then I'm going to close this all out in one quick prayer. Just pray, pray for a second here. goes for you at home too that are watching the stream pray yeah I see you not really I'm going to close this out in prayer and I just want to challenge you this week step up your prayer step it up bring it up a level and, and, and I challenge you, pray that God will multiply your time. Don't use time as an excuse anymore. Because God stands outside of time. He can make you productive. He can make you finish a whole day's work in two hours. I know he can. He's done it. He's done crazy, crazy things that I can't explain when I've been short on time. And I prayed and seeked his face. I'll close this out in prayer, and you can continue to pray if you want to. Father, your goodness, it just knows no bounds, Lord. And I know you've been waiting to pour out, to pour out your goodness on this land, Lord. You've been waiting for your church. You've been waiting for your church to humble herself and to get before you and seek your face. And I see this, I see this enormous reservoir, this enormous dam, and it's ready to burst. God is ready to open up the floodgates and just pour it out on our land. And he's just waiting for a people who will seek his face. Lord, let us be that people. Let us be that people, Lord. I pray that we, as we go out, Lord, that will be your agents, will be the people called by your name, Lord, will carry your name into the world, full of hope, love, and faith, Lord, and will make a difference. Pray this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Church, you're dismissed. I love you. Have an incredible week.